Okay, I've been charged with uh, gathering you all back for the uh, commencement of the next session. So if you can grab a seat. Alrighty, so uh, I'm going to talk to you about our spoke project today, which is rapid identification and validation of human craniofacial development genes. The idea that informed this project was really uh, an effort in functional genomics to see if we could use the power of genome sequencing to identify challenging uh, uh, cases, uh, resolve challenging cases of craniofacial birth defects to the gene level, and then uh, use the zebrafish model to basically validate or confirm the uh, analysis from bioinformatics. So uh, basically there were three aims. They're shown for you here. The idea is very simple, basically to identify these patients with all sorts of challenging craniofacial dysmorphoses. Our collaborators here have included uh, Joan Stoller and Catherine Nowak at Boston Children's Hospital, also Pedro Sanchez, who's here from uh, LA Children's Hospital, and now Cedar sinai and then uh, Ophir Klein from UCSF, and we've had other cases as well. So those are the inputs to uh, the analysis. Uh, we're using mostly whole exome sequencing. Some have been analyzed by genome when we're looking for regulatory mutations. That's uh, work being done with Pedro. The bioinformatic analysis is to identify the variant containing genes using a state-of-the-art pipeline, and then when ambiguity remains, as it often does, to try to resolve those using the power of uh, zebrafish modeling. So uh, just to quickly reacquaint you. I've shown this slide in the past, but it's always useful. Um, anybody in this room can recognize that this is a genetically transmitted disorder in a dominant fashion. The uh, dirty little secret is those are very difficult cases to solve bioinformatically because if you just sequence the trio, there'll be some 50 variants that are shared in this case between mother and proband, and that's too many for even a very talented developmental biologist to resolve. It's just beyond the realm of possibility. But if you sequence a distant family member, like this uh, cousin, you can reduce the number of variants by about 50% for every meiosis. So in this case, it would be about 12 and a half. And that's getting to less than 10, which is the threshold we like to use for what we can actually track, uh, tractably tackle in the lab. Um, the more powerful paradigms are these two over here. And these are not commonly recognized by clinicians as being genetic. These are simplex cases where there's a single affected individual, the birth defect. Parents are often uh, astonished. They don't have any genetic history in the family that they know of. One can be a de novo dominant where there's a uh, germline mutation. That's obviously if you sequence that trio, you're looking for new mutations that appear with the phenotype in the proband, and that's a very simple bioinformatic case to solve. Uh, we typically get with our filters set for a minor allele frequency of less than one, we usually get about zero to three variants that are encoding regions. Recessive, a bit more, can be compound heterozygous or in consanguineous populations or homozygous. There's some assumptions, monogenic inheritance, complete penetrance, and we're looking only at coding regions and splice junctions uh, and structural variants. So we're missing the regulatory genome in these analyses. So when we set out to do this, our initial projection was we'd like to try to solve about 25 cases over five years, novel cases, about five per year. That using the extrapolation from the Baylor sequence of about 25 percent success rate would imply we'd have to accept and sequence about 100 cases. That would be about 250 to 300 individuals, assuming 2.5 or 3 trio uh, individuals per case, and then pursue the functional experiments as appropriate to the case. Initially, we were going to use morpholinos to target these genes in the case of loss of function. As you'll hear, it's much more complex than that. Many of these cases are gain of function or missense variants, which are not simply remediable to a simple loss of function approach. Nonetheless, we've evaluated 130 cases. Some get rejected because the family members that we need to sequence to solve the case are not available. Some are deferred until we can get the samples uh, uh, from the patients we need. So we've accepted 100, and we've basically sequenced 50 of those to date. 50 are still awaiting consent or sample collection. Of those, we've analyzed 46. I'll tender that we've solved 14 of those, and another 10 are likely solved. By likely solved, what I'm saying is that we've resolved it to a strong candidate gene or pair of candidate genes. And then lastly, uh, Eric and his team have made models for about 14 of these. Um, 
Here's a list of the genes that are in play so far. There's about 24 genes on this slide. The uh, ones that have the yellow asterisks are solved by the typical criteria of solution, which involve either finding a second hit case, that's a case that recapitulates the phenotype uh, with an intergenic mutation in the same gene, an independent case, or recapitulation of major aspects of the phenotype from an animal model, either mouse or fish most typically, or a cellular or biochemical assay that supports the functionality of that particular variant. Obviously, there are extra points if you get all three of those, but uh, typically these genes over here satisfy those criteria. The ones that are not asterisks are ones we're calling provisionally solved. We've narrowed it down to a candidate gene, but as you'll see in a few minutes, that's where the challenge begins in terms of modeling this. You know, I, I'm reminded that uh, Victor McCusick used to mention that the number of monogenic disorders in the human disease assume is not simply the number of loss and gain of function alleles for every gene, because as you'll see, every missense variant has the potential to confer a somewhat unique or different phenotype. And so sorting that out is uh, really a, a fundamental problem in genome annotation. So the genes I'm going to review very quickly are in yellow here. Basically, uh, those were solved the last time I talked. Then I'm going to talk about some newer ones uh, after that. So this is a case we got from Pedro some time ago. Uh, to his credit, he thought this was a case of acrosystosis, uh, uh, but uh, hard to diagnose. Here's the family history over here, just an affected proband. You see this debilitating uh, disorder, severe hypertelorism, uh, missing digits. And basically, uh, what we identified was a de novo mutation, uh, this asparagine to lysine, uh, excuse me, tyrosine mutation in uh, RNA polymerase one, the largest unit of RNA polymerase. And so with that, when we looked in the literature, we realized there was a paper in the American Journal of Human Genetics uh, just a year before basically describing this new syndrome. And so that really pointed out to me that even the best dysmorphologists uh, in the world, and I think the ones we've assembled are rank in that category, have a very difficult time resolving these kinds of cases. The facial recognition, or the recognition of the facial deformities in these children are sufficiently subjective that it's very difficult in many of these cases to render a diagnosis. And so one of the take-home lessons is really the incredible power of DNA sequencing to immediately confirm or can provide a diagnosis, even if the disease gene is new, uh, not new in this case. Um, so here's another quick case. This is a case of sagittal craniosynostosis, again from Pedro, Raban sequence macrocephaly. Oops, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, and as you can see, uh, severe deformity, frontal bossing, global developmental delay. This child actually had a unique phenotypic finding in having a cerebellar glioma, a uh, tumor in the cerebellum. Uh, it hasn't really progressed, but it turned out when we sequenced the genome, we found a canonical splice donor mutation. This is the AGGT dinucleotide uh, pair that occurs at the end of every exon, uh, highly invariant, although sometimes can vary. But in this particular case, uh, there's a T to C transition. That basically is a, a loss of functional allele. This is a haploinsufficiency sufficiency state. And in this particular case, this gene is expressed in glial cells and is, in fact, responsible for uh, differentiation. So the abrogation of this gene function provides a very logical explanation for the glioma in this child. Here's one more quick case. This is a case of Eric's that came to the clinic as uh, an Amish family. There you immediately suspect a recessive inheritance. This is basically this oblique facial clefting phenotype as seen here. After repair, uh, still uh, severe microphthalmia. When we sequence this familiar territory, there's a homeodomain mutation, a missense mutation in the middle of the second helix uh, right there. That's almost certainly a loss of function allele. So this is a homozygous case. And so uh, Eric taken this on and modeled this in the lab, basically using uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technology to make alleles of this for ALX1, 3, and 4, if I understand correctly. The idea is that uh, the guide RNAs are all being dis designed upstream, so these should produce loss of function, most likely. Here's a rapid screening assay showing deletomers, and so this is being undertaken now. We've abandoned the morpholino approach, not because it's not useful, it's very quick, but there is the 
ever-present problem of nonspecific effects. And when you're trying to make a case for phenotypic recapitulation, it's really problematic. So although this takes much longer, three generations really to get a clean allele, uh, it provides a definitive resource and also a permanent resource that can be distributed to the community. So as I said, that's basically what we're doing now. Um, all right, so some new cases, uh, talk about three of these. None of these is a home run, but they're all interesting in their own way. The, the first case, SMARC uh, A4, uh, face base 11, is a case of maxillary hypoplasia with face away symmetry, asymmetry sort of illustrates that uh, you can land on a known gene but with an interesting missense mutation. Um, here's the child here. This is a case of Catherine Nowak's uh, microcephaly. The pictures aren't very good, but she has a very severe facial asymmetry, which you can kind of see here, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, also, subtle findings, oops, subtle findings affecting the nose. The nose is very small. There's a single maxillary incisor here. The philtrum, the space between the nose and the upper lip is expanded, and the upper lip is very thin um, in comparison to the lower lip. So there's also a variety of syndromic features here. Uh, ocular uh, growth retardation, probably thought to be due to some midline defect in the child, uh, obstructive sleep apnea and hearing loss, uh, corpus callosum, and global delay. So uh, the Again, these are mostly going to be trio cases in which only the proband is affected, so we sequence the trio. Uh, basically, there's also an unaffected sister that can be used for additional segregation analysis. I won't go through the gen prior genetic testing, but most of the patients we get have had a litany of these tests done, and so one of the key points is that genomic sequencing or exome sequencing hugely cost efficient for these kinds of patients. Uh, the cost of one panel is more than the cost of uh, a, a exome or genome. Research exome costing us less than $300 now. Even a clinical exome is costing less than 1000 So um, the panel costs are one to 2000 at least. All right, so in this particular case, we landed on a gene SMARC A4. I'm not going to go into a lot of the functional aspects of it, except to say it's quite interesting. It's a sweet sniff related matrix associated actin dependent regulator of chromatin, if you can. Remember all that? Um, that is a protein that's part of the BRG complex that binds acetylated lysines in chromatin and is involved in chromatin remodeling. And the missense variant falls in this extremely conserved residue here, uh, this aspartic acid to an asparagine mutation in the C-terminus of this protein. And this is showing you human mouse and zebrafish sequences aligned. So what does this all mean? So this gene, actually, when you find it, then you look it up, and you find it's been linked to a gene called Coffin serous type 4, which is caused by mutations in these four different related genes. Uh, SMARC, A, SMARC A4 is underlined there. The interesting thing is that this loss of, loss of function of this by truncation, which is not what we have here, causes a rhabdoid uh, sarcoma syndrome. These mutations are all missense, the ones that we found and the ones that are previously reported, are all missense variants or in-frame deletions, so they would preserve the reading frame. So they're presumably not causing loss of function. And so this is a heterozygous de novo variant, which are always specially uh, tractable and usually compelling for causality. And so basically you can see these are a panel of kids you can see that there's maybe a nuance of facial asymmetry to some of these. Some of the other features I would mention are hardly even present. And there's no way, I think, you could have made this diagnosis without just simply doing sequencing. Now, what's interesting here is that this particular missense variant falls in a unique area of the SMARC A4 protein. It's not in the bromo domain, which is at the C-terminus. It's not at the uh, ATPase region or the helicase. It's actually in the... DLX binding domain, right uh, in a region that interacts with the known transcriptional regulator that many of us know about called DLX, which affects, among other things, uh, tooth and craniofacial development. So the working model would be that in some way that missense variant affects the interaction with DLX. And so that's a point that has to be taken up by further investigation. Um, but nonetheless, it underscores the utility of sequencing these cases. All right, here's another case. This is a case of midline cleft lip and cleft palate 
But the important point here is what's called lobar holoprosencephaly. And so I think most of us know that holoprosencephaly is a reductive deformity of the, of the development of the head um, due to defects in the sonic signaling pathway. But lobar HPE is actually the form that specifically affects uh, the brain, which is not cleanly partitioned then into hem uh, left and right hemispheres. So in this particular case, there are a variety of other findings as well, unilateral renal agenesis and a hypoplastic nose and midface. This is not the proband, but this is actually a picture taken from Max Monkey's review. It shows you the range of phenotypes you can have in this particular disorder from severe holoprosencephaly, a lobar as it's called, semi-lobar here with a midline cleft, lobar shown here with an almost normal facial appearance, and then uh, midline interhemispheric variant. And so, this is a continuum of sonic signaling, basically, from severely deranged to almost normal. And so uh, our patient is somewhere between B and C, probably closer to C. Um, here's the family history. This shows you what you're kind of up against with some of these cases, although in the end it reduces to simplicity, I think. So one of the findings that came with this patient was the finding of a GLEE2 variant in some of the family members. And we thought, well, GLEE2 is in the sonic pathway. It's a, a missense variant, arginine to glutamine. Maybe it's a uh, loss or gain of functional allele, and that could modulate sonic signaling. So the, uh, that had some semblance of normalcy until we realized that really only the proband was affected. A very sensitive pointer here. Um, the mother, who carries the GLEE2 variant, and the uh, half-sister um, also have it, but don't have low bar HPE a high palate in one case and a cleft palate in the other, we think those are true, true, and unrelated. And that shows you some of the assumptions you have to make, uh, I think, to solve these cases. A uh, variety of genetic testing was normal, 7-dehydrocholesterol, which is a marker for uh, opley lemley uh, syndrome, was normal. And so this is a typical output uh, in a variant file from our pipeline, and uh, I'll come back to this in a few minutes. Um, the idea is that uh, we have de novo homozygous recessive and compound heterozygous variants for many of these cases. And the de novo always gets special attention. Now, the way we prioritize these, I should say that, there's several criteria. I should have put this on a slide. One of them are just the nature of the variant that we find. So we weight nonsense, frame shift, and canonical splice mutations uh, more so than missense or extended splice site mutations. We also look at the representation of these variants in NOMAD, the genome aggregator database that's maintained to both has 100,000 sequences in it. So if that particular variant's never been seen before, that increases the likelihood that that's a uh, functionally relevant uh, disease-causing variant. Um, and then there are other things. Does it fall in a known domain of a protein? And if there's a structure for that domain, would it affect the structure? Um, and then, of course, whatever's in the literature that would support or refute the involvement. If it's been knocked out in an animal model before, does it have a related phenotype or not? So from that, we discounted all the genes except for one, the gene CARD8. CARD8 turned out to be very interesting. So the reason it's interesting is it fits right into the sonic signaling pathway, which uh, we didn't appreciate until we found it. So CARD actually stands for Caspase Activation and Recruitment Domain. That's a specific domain in the CARD8 protein that interacts with the patched receptor. And the short story here from these points is that if you do a co-immunoprecipitation of the patched sonic receptor with uh, another protein called DRAL and another protein, CARD8, they all come down together in a complex. And that complex is essential for the activity of unliganded patch to lead to apoptosis. So that's functionally equivalent to what happens if sonic is missing or downregulated. And so that fit very nicely with the idea that a gain of function mutation in this CARD8 gene would be responsible for hyperactivating the patch receptor apoptosis pathway, mimicking, in effect, the loss of sonic. So we think this is a new holoprosencephaly gene in the sonic pathway. And this experiment of nature, as it were, would uh, be evidence for that. I won't go through the uh, findings at the bottom except to say that the particular mutation we found here is in this fiend domain right here, and that's the part that interacts with the patched receptor. So the idea is that somehow that missense variant 
forms a stronger complex and stabilizes this caspase activation function with caspase 9, which is the business effector of, of patch signaling. All right, so card eight. Okay, last, last case. Um, this is a case, Piero Band syndrome. Um, this is a case from Ophira Klein at UCSF. And there was also, uh, this is a female, that's a picture of her at 19 years of age. She had a whole litany of other defects, congenital cardiac defects, natural septal defect, uh, obstructive sleep apnea and obesity, ocular abnormalities, hearing loss, and severe uh, cognitive delay. Um, the genetic testing was normal. The clinical diagnosis was perhaps some kind of Kabuki syndrome. Uh, this shows you the, um, a couple new innovations that we've taken. One is to try to translate the clinical description of these phenotypes into HPO terms. So hopefully this will make Jim Brinkley happy. So in terms of putting this on the hub, we have to deposit the sequences, and then we have to find a way to link the clinical description of the phenotype to the sequence so that it'll be useful for others who come later. And that might be important because, as you'll see, many of these phenotypes are not standard. They're not, they are, uh, have some unifying features, but many different features, and this will be a good illustration of that. And so the idea is that it's not just single gene disorder, it's a single gene disorder with modifier loci. And so if you wanted then to go to a second generation experiment, you would want to know what are the other variants that are co-segregating in this patient that explain the difference in the phenotype from what has been reported in other patients. And so we're beginning to get to that level now. We have a couple cases that are likely digenic in inheritance. They're much more challenging to figure out, but um, probably many of these cases will have not just environmental modifiers, but other secondary genetic modifiers as well. Um, so many of the terms translate one-on-one, but as you can see, a few of them get standardized in that way, and if they have HPO numbers, then at least we're using a controlled vocabulary. Here's a uh, uh, pedigree that was lifted right from the genetic counselor's notes, but the only important thing is that the, uh, basically, if you look at the nuclear family, it's just a simple trio. It's mom and dad, and then the affected proband over here. There's other things segregating in this family, that's often the case. You really have to parse out what the core phenotype that you want to identify is. Um, here's just a summary of how we go about the sequencing. Was it uh, reanalyzed? We did exomes. We're doing the most of them at Yale. Uh, TRIO, uh, relatives available for sequencing. We find two de novo dominants, five compound hets. Here's the, uh, probably the answer. It's a haploinsufficiency mutation in MED13L, mediator in RNA transcription. You can see very nicely when you have data like this, these are the parents down below. The proband has a single base pair deletion that would cause a uh, stop codon in the coding region. So we're looking at this de novo variant as causal. Now here's the thing, if you go to the literature, you'll find a report, European Journal of Human Genetics. These are three cases that were reported there, all with uh, loss of function alleles, haploinsufficiency. It's pretty hard to see how you could have gone from this facial gestalt to this and realize that that was part of the same syndrome. So basically, this really again illustrates the point I keep coming back to, which is as a standard of care, exome or genome sequencing should be the standard for kids with birth defects of this sort. Uh, it immediately provides a diagnosis. Even if these are not treatable today, uh, they may be remediable in the future. All right, so last point, and then I'll wrap up. This basically was taken from that paper. You can see the findings are so nonspecific and present in only a certain fraction of these series that you would never be able to make the case that that patient had this particular disorder. So sequencing is really pivotal. Uh, how would this mutation work? This is basically just a collage of data taken from the literature from this paper by Utami that shows you that uh, Morpholino experiments in this case have a phenotype. Um, you can see there's curvature, there's loss of the eyes, there's some craniofacial anom anomalies here, but it really doesn't tell you uh, what our particular mutation is doing. So this would be a nice target for CRISPR, Cas9. Uh, Eric's taken that under, underway. One point I'll make is that there is maternal expression of this gene, so that's normally a problem when you make a uh, zebrafish mutant because the maternal RNA pools will rescue the phenotype. 
I think uh, Eric's trying some new technologies using RNA knockdown using uh, Cas13 uh, that might get around that. And so we're eager to see how these uh, experiments uh, turn out. But basically, this would show you that you could test the haploid sufficiency hypothesis in this particular case. All right, so and these are the guide RNAs. The mutant's already been made. We'll see what the phenotype is. All right, so to wrap up, um, the point I've made is that exome is a powerful tool for diagnosing craniofacial dysmorphoses. Variable expressivity, I would say, from our studies to date, are the rule, not the exception, and I think that's a challenging uh, circumstance. The, the idea there would be that the sequences we put on the hub, we put about 60 have been sent, about half of those are uploaded. Um, they have to be linked to the clinical data sets. We envision five data sets to go with each uh, case, and we can talk about them later. There's time. Would be to allow others then to compare related cases that are not identical in terms of other variants that segregate and might explain those differences, and that'll be something that'll be increasingly uh, important in the field. Um, importance of getting the right family members, looking at paralogs of known gene, and then, of course, the downstream functional analyses need to be customized. So I'll stop there. The most important thing to say probably is, as is true for all of our projects, these are examples of team science, and I'm very grateful personally for the wonderful work of my collaborators, especially Eric's lab, many of whom are, are here today. So thank you. Don't be shy, okay. Oh yeah, can you, um, we have someone uh, handling this side of the room. And so that was Joan, can you raise your hand? Okay, great. Is your mic on? Ooh, yeah. Can you try it again? Yeah, I, I can repeat the question. So I'm sorry, just for our webcasters, if you could try it again. Now you can, okay. 25% you mentioned is about what you would find with exome sequencing. That, that's a statistic that uh, Baylor, which is, of course, one of the leaders in this field, have published for their series. Now, those are more, they're not as challenging cases, if I can say it that way. But nonetheless, that's a metric, that's a, a, a parameter you could use as a rule of thumb. So I'm, I'm just curious um, about all the dark matter there in the genome and how many more you can find if you um, could explore that better. Yeah. So. The question is, why can't we do better? Um, in this particular case, we've solved, we think, about 14 out of 46. That's about 30 percent. But there are no, no, another 10 that are likely, the ones I consider provisional, which would boost the percentage significantly, almost to 50 percent. I think that's because we're putting, investing so much time. You can't do these sort of experiments in a routine clinical diagnostic lab, which is where the statistic I gave you of 25 percent came from. But that still leaves the a question you're asking, which is what about the other 50 percent or so? So I think that there's a good chance that many of those will be regulatory variants in non-coding sequences and that those will be available through whole genome sequencing. And so we've taken on a pilot project in that regard. I might have mentioned this last time I talked. We took two genes that are linked to specific regions in the genome, but when we've sequenced them by exome, they're negative. And so the reason for doing this is if you just search the whole genome for variants, you'll have 100 times more variants than we're finding in these, too much noise. But if you know the gene, you can constrain the search space to about two megabases uh, upstream or downstream. And then you get a handful of variants, and then you can map those with regulatory regions, like the ones we've heard, going to hear about from Axel, um, and see if they, they line up. Um, there will be a poster on this from Pedro Sanchez on one of those families that has Bohr syndrome due to EYA1 mutations. And uh, we have about a dozen variants. Some of those are kind of interesting, but we don't have a functional experiment to prove which one or ones are causal at the moment. So I think there will be a lot of those to be found. And there's also structural variants in non-coding regions that are not being analyzed uh, very well at the moment, too. Any other questions? So um, 
I think it's fantastic that you're actually putting in the limelight that modifiers have a major effect on the sort of presentation of a lot of these different disorders and the importance of knowing that. And now we're sort of, we've gotten all the, the low hanging fruit and now we're actually trying to figure out what actually genetic variation is equal to phenotypic variation. Do you have a set guideline or, or like, you know, methodology by which you're gonna to try to test these things? So the haploid insufficiency was great, but that's easy, right? So when you start getting into modifiers, it's gonna get really tricky really fast. Yeah. Um, I guess the short answer is no. <laughs> um, in the cases where we think we have diagenic inheritance, uh, what we've done is we've had design experiments to test the genetic interaction. The problem is none of the scales, uh, they're all one-offs. So you're asking, is there more a more general approach? Uh, I'll give you one example that I was just talking to Mimi Jabs about in, in the context of craniosynostosis, but it could be in, in, in any of these disorders. So the output of our experiments are large VCF files. When we go through the BAM files of sequence and then reduce them to variants that we find uniquely in our proband that segregate uniquely with the disease, we get dozen genes or more, dozen hits per case, sometimes more. And so we might find the causal gene. The question is, you know, could you use gene expression data sets of the kind we were hearing about today to filter that? Um, we talked about this a long time ago, but now we're getting to the point where it's actually feasible, not just for the causal gene, but for other genes. So in other words, if there's 12 other variants in that list, and I only have one that I think is causal, but there's another dozen to worry about, could I say which of those are expressed in the osteogenic front in a case where we have craniosynostosis? And, um, you know, you can think about that applied to different facial regions. I think Mimi made the point, maybe you'd like to say something more about the fact that these gene expression sets are not just specific to the cranial sutures, but also affect other parts of the developing face. So you could actually mine more than your money's worth, so to speak, by looking at, you're basically, it's a power of convergent data sets. Both sets are noisy and large, but if you put them together, you might be able to zero in on some of the additional modifiers. But I'd still argue, similar to the comment about the single cell RNA-seq, is that we have to test these functionally. There can at, be correlations just from the, the vast number of things we're looking at. But. At, at the end of the day, but if you can filter it to a manageable level, you can do the experiment. Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned the poster because it's sort of a work in progress, and I think on the clinical side, this is a, a big challenge. Clearly Mendelian, clearly there's a spectrum of presentation, and so trying to see if there's a second hit or a modifier out there, you know, picking your brains would be fun. Um, looking at the current um, RNA-seq data and trying to use that clinically is, is you know, uh, caution is, is really, in the, the data wasn't, um, what's well, intended for use for clinical purposes, but when we have a can candidate gene from exome, exome sequencing on a clinical basis, uh, we have gone to GEO and to see if there's um, that one um, gene was expressed at the right time in the right tissue, and it's not captured really by the face-based hub, but it is in the data. Um, it is shared and it is uh, useful clinically, at least to help us move um, some of the stories forward a little bit. Okay, so I think, uh, uh, thank you very much, Dick. Yep. Uh, we're ready for our final presentation before lunch, and so we have Jim Brinkley next.